Hello and welcome to NTD News Today. Kevin Hogan here. Let's take a look at our top stories. Omicron cases surging across the United States. What does that mean for the holidays? We have updates from top health officials. And many Americans are feeling anxious about their travel plans. They're flocking to testing sites to ensure a negative test before seeing relatives. President Biden says he's even more likely to run for re-election in 2024 if he can face former President Donald Trump. But he also says he's a great respecter of fate. The Omicron variant is spreading fast across the United States, just a month after the World Health Organization named it a variant of concern. And today's Jessica Beatty has the latest. Cases of the CCP virus are surging in the United States. The CDC said Wednesday that the seven-day average increased by 25 percent from the previous week to about 149,000 cases per day. The CDC estimated that Omicron accounted for about 73 percent of new cases in the U.S. last week. CDC Director Rochelle Walensky says virus-related deaths are of about 3.5% compared to the previous week. Although this is a reminder of continued threat of COVID-19 variants, this increase in Omicron proportion is what we anticipated and what we have been preparing for. Americans facing a second Christmas of upended holiday plans. But White House Medical Advisor Dr. Anthony Fauci says it is safe to gather with loved ones if you take precautions. Would it be safe for individuals who are vaccinated, who are boosted, to get together with family in the setting of the home? The answer to that is yes. An extra level of protection would be the testing that Dr. Walensky measured. Fauci did warn against large gatherings of dozens of people. And over in the Big Apple, officials are temporarily limiting visitations at city-run jails and hospitals. Uh, But we've had uh, a recent outbreak in our one of our hospitals that we think is related to uh, visitors not of course their fault but for a short time in order to make sure that we don't cause more disease we need to limit uh, the number of visitors but he says hospitals will make exceptions for some patients including women in labor sick children and terminally ill patients nyc's 11 city-run hospitals currently have 54 covid patients in intensive care That's a mere fraction of the hospital system's March 2020 peak of 970 patients in intensive care. 19 urgent care medical clinics were closed Wednesday in New York City and New Jersey, at least for now. The company says this is to preserve its ability to staff its sites, but it didn't elaborate on the staffing issue. And residents of Washington, D.C. will soon have to show proof of vaccination to enter restaurants, gyms, and some other indoor facilities. The new rule will apply to people ages 12 and up. It goes into effect January 15th. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. A staffer at the White House who was in close contact with Vice President Kamala Harris has tested positive for COVID-19. Senior advisor for the VP, Simone Sanders, says the staffer was with the vice president throughout the day Tuesday. Sanders says the staff member tested negative for COVID-19 every day this week until Wednesday morning. The staff member is fully vaccinated and asymptomatic. As for Harris, the White House says she is tested on a regular basis. The vice president tested negative Wednesday on an antigen and PCR test. She will be tested again on Friday and Monday. Harris will not quarantine. She is traveling to Los Angeles for the holidays. Americans are facing a second Christmas of upended holiday plans with a surge in CCP virus infections fueled by the now dominant Omicron variant. And many have been forced to cancel travel plans. And today's Andrew Thomas has the details. The swift rise in infections from Omicron has caused fresh concern around holiday travel. Many Americans flock to testing sites or scramble to get at-home tests this week to ensure a negative test result before heading to see relatives. If I test positive, I'm just staying in town, not visiting family. So, fingers crossed that it's a negative te- test. At Washington, D.C.'s Union Station, people waited for loved ones to arrive from out of state. A lot of people at my work have just tested positive. I'm still testing negative, so definitely the past few days in particular with the record highs, I'm a lot more hesitant about travel. Yeah, I don't really have a lot of concerns because I've been vaccinated and have boosted and uh, tested and and, um, people are pretty good about social distancing and everybody's got their masks on, so 
I'm, you know, I'm pretty comfortable. Still, some Americans are waiting to decide whether to press forward with their holiday travel plans. I think that's how it should be. I mean, we're going to have to live with this forever. So, like, I think at this point we just kind of got to accept it and just kind of go about our lives and just keep traveling. You know, we got to enjoy ourselves, got to see family, got to do things during the holidays, you know. Hey, now, Merry Christmas. The Transportation Security Administration screened more than 2 million passengers through the nation's airports each day from December 16th through December 20th about double the number of people who passed through the airports on those dates in 2020. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A California judge ruled in favor of a lawsuit that sought to challenge a school district's student vaccine mandate, but the school district is now seeking to appeal the case. We hear more from NTD's Cynthia Kai. The San Diego Unified School District announced Tuesday that it's seeking to appeal a court ruling in a lawsuit challenging its vaccine mandate for students. SDUSD initially planned to enroll students ages 16 and up who are not fully vaccinated for COVID-19 in independent study on January 24, 2022. However, Let Them Choose, a group of local families filed a lawsuit back in October. On Monday, San Diego Superior Court Judge John S. Meyer ruled the school district's mandate contradicts state law. We are thrilled uh, that the court ruled in our favor. We thought that the legal issues were very clear and uh, the judge agreed with us that school districts don't have authority to put forward a patchwork of different vaccine mandates. Uh, They can't contradict with state law. Uh, We are really happy with the decision and we're glad that all students are going to be able to remain in class. The San Diego School District said in a statement that it is determined to maintain the vaccine mandate and voted unanimously to appeal. Let Them Choose says they are ready to defend their case in an appellate court. We are completely confident uh, these legal issues were so clear and uh, we're absolutely confident that the appellate court will see it the same way. And again, you know, if we... uh, prevail in the appellate court, then that will just set actual uh, binding legal precedent statewide. Judge Meyer says implementing vaccine mandates without religious or personal belief exemptions can only be imposed by the state legislature. He also said students are required to receive some vaccinations in order to attend in-person school, but adding COVID-19 to the list is also a policy only the state can impose. Per the court ruling, SDUSD for now cannot enforce a student vaccine mandate. Cynthia Kai, NTD News, California. President Joe Biden says he intends to run for re-election in 2024. This, despite being the oldest person to hold the office of the presidency. In an interview with David Muir from ABC News, the president says he plans on being on the ballot again, especially if he gets a chance to go head-to-head with former President Donald Trump. Do you plan to run for re-election? Yes. But look, I'm a great respecter of fate. Fate has intervened in my life many, many times. If I'm in the health I'm in now, if I'm in good health, then, in fact, I would run again. And if that means a rematch against Donald Trump? You're trying to tempt me now. (laughs) Sure. Why would I not run against Donald Trump or even the nominee? That would increase the prospect of running. Earlier this week, the two men exchanged compliments. Biden praised the fact that Trump got his COVID booster shot, and Trump told Fox News he appreciates Biden's praise. Pennsylvania Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon says she was carjacked at gunpoint Wednesday afternoon in Philadelphia, but was not physically hurt. Her office says it happened at FDR Park after a meeting there. Philadelphia police say Scanlon was walking to her car when she was approached by two males. They demanded her keys and she handed them over. One of the men drove off in her car while the other got in an SUV and followed it. The FBI is now leading the investigation. Scanlon, a Democrat, has served in the U.S. House since 2018. She represents part of Philadelphia and its suburbs. Four people were injured when a fire erupted at ExxonMobil's complex in Baytown, Texas. It's one of the largest refining and petrochemical facilities in the United States. The Baytown plant houses the country's second biggest oil refinery. It has the capacity to process over 550,000 barrels of crude oil per day. The Harris County Sheriff tweeted that three people were evacuated by rescue helicopter and a fourth person was taken by ambulance. Initial reports indicated there had been some type of explosion at the plant, but there were no reports to evacuate or shelter in place. Social media users said on Twitter that a blast shook buildings in the area. 
The Baytown Complex was founded in 1919 and encompasses about 3,400 acres. It's about 25 miles east of Houston. Oxford High School in Michigan is planning to slowly reopen. This is the location of the November shooting that killed four and wounded seven others. Oxford Community Schools says the reopening will begin in mid-January and the process will take until the end of the month. An announcement from the school system says it attempted to contact families of Oxford High School students for input. The district will also hold town hall meetings to get feedback on reopening plans. 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly is facing multiple charges in the shooting. These include four counts of first-degree murder. He is being charged as an adult. His parents face charges of involuntary manslaughter for allegedly not securing the gun in their home, allowing Ethan easy access. All three are being held in the same jail. One of the nation's largest military landlords, Balfour Beatty Communities, has pleaded guilty to fraud. The Justice Department says it has resolved the entire investigation. The probe was prompted by a 2019 Reuters report. It describes how Balfour Beatty falsified maintenance documents to qualify for millions of performance bonuses. Five former employees admitted to forging records, company emails, and internal Air Force communications. Investigators said the company failed to repair housing for service members as required, causing military members and their families to live in hostile conditions. Balfour Beatty has agreed to pay more than $65 million in fines and restitution. A company spokesman said today they will take full responsibility. Investigators believe the pervasive fraud has to do with the company's broken corporate culture. The New Year's Eve celebration at New York's Times Square will go ahead as scheduled, but Mayor Bill de Blasio says the city is working with health officials on additional safety measures amid rising virus cases. So in working with the sponsors of the event, working with our health care leaders, uh, right now, two great virtues, all vaccinated audience and outdoors. We're looking to add additional measures uh, to make it even safer. So we're still in discussion. Uh, the goal, of course, is to keep it going because it's such an important event for New Yorkers and for the whole world. De Blasio didn't give any more details on the measures, but he did say no more shutdowns. He said they aren't needed this year because the city is more prepared. Earlier this month, de Blasio announced a vaccine mandate for all private sector employees in the city. That's set to take effect next week. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio has just signed a bill that prohibits any newly constructed buildings from having gas lines, with few exceptions. The law is the first of its kind for a large, cold-weather city. This is a move the city says will help address the climate crisis. And today's Jason Perry spoke with an energy and environmental expert to see what's at stake. All newly constructed residential and commercial buildings in New York City will no longer be allowed to have natural gas lines. The mandate will have exemptions for certain uses, such as commercial kitchens and emergency or standby power. According to research by the Rocky Mountain Institute, the law will prevent over 2 million tons of carbon emissions by 2040, equivalent to taking 450,000 cars off the road for a year. We are convinced this is going to have a major impact uh, right here in this city, reducing emissions, improving health, because less pollution equals better health, uh, but also setting an example that other cities, states, nations will follow. When New York City does something, it is felt all over the world. So all new buildings will be electric by 2027. Residents of these all-electric buildings will have to use electric heating, which is generally more expensive than gas heating. Frank Lassay is the president of Truth in Energy and Climate, an organization dedicated to energy and climate issues. He said the city's shift towards electricity coincides with the Biden administration's push to move away from fossil fuels, which can have unexpected consequences. Really interesting because at the same time they're doing this, they're closing down reliable coal plants. They plan to close down a nuclear plant. They just closed down other plants and they have this weird concept that they can run their electric grid, their electric system, on wind and solar. And why I say that's weird is most people don't understand that both wind and solar produce very little energy or no energy 70% of the time. De Blasio also said every public vehicle in New York City will eventually be electric, whether it's a school bus, a police vehicle, or the cars driven by city officials. But Lassay explained that electric vehicles can also have a negative impact on the environment. And we could get into the fact that they have to, 80% of the batteries for cars, electric vehicles, are made in China, 
burning dirty coal with, and they control 80% of the rare earth inputs into those vehicles. And poor kids are mining cobalt in, in the Congo with really bad environment for them and for the, for the earth. If you really cared about earth, we would be cleaning up those sort of things. So electric vehicles in the short term actually harm the earth. It takes seven or eight years for, for a, a electric vehicle to equal the amount of carbon dioxide it took to mine, process, and manufacture it. Jason Perry, NTD News. A migrant caravan in Mexico begins boarding buses that will bring them closer to the United States, and Haitians are suing the Biden administration for alleged racist treatment at the border. The migrant caravan left a southern Mexican city in late October. Some 5,000 people were a part of the group. Hundreds gave up on the journey after traveling on foot for weeks. An activist pressed the Mexican government to provide visas and buses for the migrants who lagged behind. A memo from Mexico's National Migration Institute said they will bus the migrants to cities near the Texas border. And several Haitians who crossed into the United States illegally are suing the Biden administration. The lawsuit is for alleged racist treatment of the roughly 15,000 Haitians who gathered in Texas in September. They camped under a bridge while they waited for border agents to process their cases. The lawsuit alleges the Biden administration mistreated the Haitians with calculated indifference and had a Haitian deterrence policy. It also seeks to allow the expelled Haitians to apply for asylum. Still to come, Intel backtracks and apologizes to China after it tells suppliers not to source parts from the Xinjiang region. Find out more here on NTD News. American chipmaker Intel is facing backlash from China after telling its suppliers not to source products or labor from the northwestern region of Xinjiang. Beijing has been accused of human rights abuses in the predominantly Muslim area. China has repeatedly denied those claims. In a statement, Intel said it had been required to, quote, ensure that its supply chain does not use any labor or source goods or services from the Xinjiang region following restrictions imposed by multiple governments. The statement was branded absurd by the Global Times, a nationalist tabloid which is published by the ruling Communist Party's official People's Daily. It accused Intel of biting the hand that feeds it. The chipmaker earned 26 percent of its total revenues from China in 2020. Intel is now backtracking over its statement. It released another Chinese language statement on its official WeChat and Weibo accounts, apologizing to its Chinese customers, partners and the public. Intel is just one of many multinational companies to have come under pressure as they aim to comply with Xinjiang-related trade sanctions while continuing to operate in China. Former New York Times reporter Alex Berenson is suing Twitter. He alleges his permanent suspension from the platform violates the First Amendment and federal and California laws. Berenson was banned from Twitter in August. Twitter says he repeatedly violated the company's COVID-19 misinformation rules. Those rules prohibit sharing what the company deems false or misleading information about COVID-19. According to the lawsuit, Berenson was assured by a senior Twitter executive that he would not be banned from the platform even after he started critically covering the COVID-19 vaccines. The lawsuit says that Twitter has in the past relied on Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act to defend itself against similar lawsuits, but this does not shield the company from California's constitution or common carrier law. Berenson wrote on his blog that California's common carrier law means Twitter cannot reject messages posted to its platform simply because it disagrees with them. Twitter has not filed a response to the complaint. The wealthiest man in the world recently sat down with the Babylon Bee for a loose, long-form conversation. They were able to question him for over an hour. And today's fake quarter has more. Like, why can't he fly if he's Batman? Bats can fly. 
Yeah, that's yeah. true. He just yeah, he glides, he glides yeah. very effectively, though. Yeah. So he's really yeah, like, like a yeah. Frank. <laughs> it's more like Frank Squirrel Man. Yeah. Yeah. The world's richest man recently sat down with the Babylon Bee to discuss a wide variety of topics. I, mean, I feel so unqualified to be interviewing you right now. I think we all do. Why are we here? Like, what? What drew you, you to like you actually look, you, sit you down with us? <laughs> I'm not you the one asked for, I'm not yes. the one who asked for the podcast. You guys did. <laughs> just to be clear. With them, Elon Musk discussed things like wokeness, his time in Canada, and being the world's richest man. My cash balances are, are very, very low. Um, and at least until I sold stock, uh, which is really the first time I've actually sold stock uh, in any meaningful way, uh, was, was this quarter. Um, I, I simply had loans against my, my stock. So I, 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 if, if Tesla and SpaceX went bankrupt, I would go bankrupt too, immediately. As a young man, Musk moved to Canada by himself with only a few thousand dollars. He worked on a weed farm, chainsawed logs in a lumber mill, and did other odd jobs. He later graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with $100,000 in student debt. He says he wrote the first maps and directions on the internet, which were later bought by Compaq. So I got like $20 million from that, put most of it into uh, x.com, which merged with Confinity to create PayPal. And then I got about $180 million from that. And I put all of that into SpaceX, Tesla, and, and SolarCity. Uh, I just basically kept, you know, kept all the chips on the table. Musk called wokeness a mind virus and said that we should be aiming for a positive society. The Cambridge Dictionary defines wokeness as a state of being aware, especially of social problems like inequality. At its heart, w wokeness is divisive, um, exclusionary, um, and hateful. It's, it's, it basically gives mean people a reason, a, 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 it gives them a shield to be, to be mean and cruel, mm. armored in false virtue. The Babylon Bee is currently one of the 107 Twitter accounts he follows. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Faye Thank Quarter, you, NTD Thanks News. So Thanks so much. All right. A former U.S. Navy sailor is headed to prison. That's because she illegally sold sensitive U.S. military equipment to China. And today's Tiffany Meyer has more on the story. A former U.S. Navy sailor is headed to prison for 30 months. That's because she, with the help of her husband, secretly sold sensitive U.S. military equipment to China for their own profit. According to a Justice Department statement on Tuesday, 37-year-old Ivy Wong is a naturalized U.S. citizen from China. She admitted to having used her official position as a logistics specialist to buy military gear. Her husband then sold the equipment to online buyers in China. In one case in 2018, Wang used her military email to order a device for identifying United States military personnel in the field. She later told her command she ordered the piece of gear for her husband's camping trip. Wang also repeatedly tried to obtain top security clearance. Navy officers were alarmed to learn that she was compiling a list of the Navy's personnel records. The information she obtained, including service members' names and addresses. Wang isn't the only offender. Last November, a Chinese-American engineer who worked for a major U.S. defense contractor was sentenced to 38 months in prison. That's because he traveled to China, bringing information related to a missile guidance system with him. That's in violation of U.S. expert control law. And this July, a Chinese national was sentenced to over three years behind bars. After the person tried to illegally export engines and maritime raiding craft, or small fast boats used for patrols to China. In a speech last September, FBI Director Christopher Wray said the Bureau was opening one new Chinese counterintelligence investigation about every 10 hours. Some local authorities in China have banned Christmas celebrations this year, citing the COVID-19 or CCP virus pandemic. Leading up to Christmas, it's hard for people in China to feel the holiday spirit, either online or in real life. Local authorities in some eastern and southern provinces banned all religious activities on Christmas. Insiders told U.S.-based outlet Radio Free Asia that local public security bureaus asked churches not to host any religious gatherings during Christmas. They said it was to prevent the spread of the virus. 
A county in eastern China's Zhejiang province let restaurants and movie theaters stay open but shut down churches. Some are questioning whether the local authorities are targeting religious activities. Netizens on Chinese social media Weibo are also having a hard time finding pictures of Christmas celebrations this year. They say they only found pictures from previous years. Residents from a city in central China are facing another, even more strict lockdown. Reported virus cases are rising there, but this time, some people have been spotted trying to evade the harsh control measures. Let's take a look. The Chinese city of Xi'an is under strict pandemic control measures. Normally, the city is home to rich culture and serves as a hot spot for tourism. It's known as the resting place of China's famed terracotta warriors. But now, over 13 million residents there have been ordered to stay inside as authorities cope with a new CCP virus outbreak, the infection that causes COVID-19. Some have been spotted crying inside their locked homes at night. While groups of students scale iron fences to escape school lockdowns. The city has reported nearly 150 virus cases since early December. Though NTD cannot verify this data, China has a history of lacking transparency in its pandemic updates. In some cases, officials may under-report cases to avoid being removed from office, something done to keep up positive appearances and boost China's reputation. Xi'an officials announced new restrictions on Wednesday. According to the rules, one person per household is allowed to leave the home for essential shopping like groceries. That's allowed just once every two days. What's more, travel within the city has become difficult, as authorities have set up roadblocks. On top of that, local regulation mandates that anyone wishing to leave the city must first get approval from authorities. Video shows people getting stopped to show proof of permission at a train station. To leave via North Station, proof from your company is not useful. You have to go through the official approval process and get a proof seal from authorities, or else you are not allowed to leave. Negative virus test proof is useless. As for those traveling in other regions of China, if they're coming from places that are neighboring Xi'an or from cities in the same general direction, authorities impose mandatory quarantine stays. Anyone coming from the direction of Xi'an will have to be locked inside for 14 days at a quarantine point at their own expense, regardless of what proof they have, whether it's a virus test report or their travel history code. They don't count. According to reports from Chinese state media, the state had already closed indoor public facilities last week. At the same time, a clip captured near a school campus is raising concerns. It shows at least 11 ambulances entering and leaving the campus, while the person who filmed the clip said that emergency vehicles had muted their sirens. A leading Hong Kong university has dismantled and removed a statue from its campus site. For more than two decades, the statue has commemorated pro-democracy protesters killed during China's Tiananmen Square crackdown in 1989. A famous statue commemorating the lives lost during China's Tiananmen Square crackdown has been removed from Hong Kong University. Late on Wednesday night, security guards placed yellow barricades around the 26-foot-high copper sculpture called the Pillar of Shame. The artwork is one of the few remaining public memorials in the former British colony to remember the bloody crackdown in 1989. It features anguished human torsos to represent the pro-democracy protesters killed by the Chinese authorities. The Tiananmen incident remains a taboo subject in mainland China where it cannot be publicly commemorated. Several months ago, the university sent a legal letter to the custodians of the statue asking for its removal. In a statement, HKU said that no party had ever obtained approval to display the statue on its campus. It also called the statue fragile and said it posed potential safety issues. I'm the owner of the statue. But the Danish sculptor behind the piece has hit out at the institution. Jens Gao Schut said in a statement he was totally shocked at the move against his private property and that he would claim compensation for any damage to the sculpture. The removal of the statue is the latest step targeting people or organizations affiliated with the sensitive June 4, 1989 date and events to market. South Korea's new social distancing measures sparked resistance from business owners. They held a rally in the country's capital Wednesday, asking the government to deliver on its promise to compensate businesses. About 500 Korean small business owners took to central Seoul, 
There, they staged a protest against the country's tightening of COVID-19 measures ahead of the holiday season. We, 7 million small business owners, have been suffering from a national crisis of COVID-19. It's too tough. We can see many people around us who could not overcome the crisis and close their businesses or even committed suicide. Last week, South Korean authorities announced new social distancing rules. Measures include limiting gatherings to no more than four people and requiring that restaurants, cafes and bars close by 9 p.m. The rules will remain in place until January 2nd. Business owners voiced opposition in front of a government building, chanting slogans like abolish curbs and compensate loss. Protesters also damaged and discarded copies of business licenses on stage. One of them said the government promised to compensate businesses for their losses, but she said they never were compensated, adding that they can't afford to follow another curfew. The government did not keep any promises about what they said, so we can no longer follow the rules in a political system that only has lies. The new measures came six weeks after South Korea lifted its COVID-19 restrictions. Since then, daily cases and serious infections have hit record highs. On Thursday, the country's health authority reported more than 6,900 infections and over 100 deaths. Coming up, what did music sound like during the medieval era in Bethlehem? Researchers are trying to recreate it by studying bells and organ pipes left buried at the Church of the Nativity. Holiday vibes are in full swing in Moscow. Residents can enjoy a display of unique Christmas trees that represent cities around the world. All that and more in just a minute. It's one of the earliest Christian symbols in the East, the Good Shepherd. Israeli archaeologists discovered a ring that bears this symbol from shipwrecks. They believe it could have come from the third century. Let's take a look. The engraving on the gold and green gemstone ring shows a figure of a young boy bearing a ram or sheep on his shoulders. Archaeologists found it along with hundreds of silver and bronze coins in two shipwrecks off the coast of Israel. So what we see depicted on the gemstone, engraved on the gemstone, is, a, is a, an image of the, of the Good Shepherd. Now, the Good Shepherd was one of the earliest Christian symbols um, used by the Christian community in the East. The image of the Good Shepherd is inspired by how Jesus described his relationship to his flock of faithful followers. It came from the book of John. It, the image sort of tells um, that Jesus is the shepherd. He is the shepherd of, um, who protects the, the Christians, the early Christians. The two shipwrecks are 6th centuries and 17th centuries old, respectively. The discovery also includes Roman-era figurines and a ring carved with an image of a biblical lyre, a musical instrument. This all adds up to probably a ring which was wore, worn by a woman or a man during the mid-third century. You know, uh, uh, um, one of the earliest uh, proofs of a, of a Christian community in the, in the East. The shipwrecks were near what was once the port of Caesarea. It was where Peter baptized Cornelius the centurion in the Acts of the Apostles. The port was one of the earliest centers of Christianity and housed one of the first Christian communities. Researchers are trying to recreate music as it may have sounded 800 years ago in the birthplace of Jesus. To make this happen, they're working to make copies of Crusader era bells found close to a famous Christian church. In Bethlehem, crusaders in the mid-13th century buried these 13 bronze bells near the Church of the Nativity on the eve of a Muslim offensive. The crusaders worried the bells might otherwise be destroyed. They slathered them in animal fat to protect them from rust. Father Stefan says the crusaders had hoped to find them later on. But they left the country and they never find them out. So by chance, while the Franciscans were building the pilgrim's house to welcome the pilgrims in Bethlehem, they excavate and they find again the bells and the organ pipe. 
The bells were discovered in the early 20th century, along with 200 medieval copper pipes. The bells were part of a carillon, which is a musical piece arranged for bells. Chants would accompany the carillon inside the church. This one are important because we are in Holy Land, and we know that it was uh, then um, uh, the, the, the sounds uh, and the sounds landscape was very important here with the, the other religion. So we know that the bells really represent the Latin. Researchers estimate it will take about five years to cast fully functioning copies of these bells. The clappers of the original bells have long since rotted away but they give off a clear, high-pitched chime with a knock of the knuckles. As Christian, these bells are very significant for us because they are the bells of Bethlehem, and the bells uh, announce the, the bells are a symbol of nativity in the Christian world, so we have bells from Bethlehem, and those bells are also very important because they are one of the oldest bells that uh, we, the humanity has. The collection also includes the scepter of the Bishop of Bethlehem and candlesticks from the 12th century made in France. Father Stefan says he hopes the collection will be displayed and played at a museum in Jerusalem that's planned to open by 2024. If you're looking for a unique spectacle to enjoy on Christmas Day, NASA may have you covered. The space agency is about to launch a $10 billion next generation telescope into the heavens. That's after poor weather delayed its flight. It's the world's biggest, most powerful, and most expensive space observatory, and it's about to embark on a decades-long mission. The James Webb Space Telescope is the Hubble's successor, a next-generation observatory that scientists say will open our eyes to the wonders of the universe and even its history. The Webb's mission? To seek out the faint, twinkling light from the first stars and galaxies, providing a glimpse into cosmic creation. A telescope is really a time machine. Because light travels at a finite speed through the universe, we see the universe as it existed when that light was emitted. It's traveled through time and space, and we detect it later on. Webb is about 100 times more sensitive than Hubble. Astronomers say that advance will reveal a glimpse of the cosmos never previously seen, capturing sights from as far back as over 13 billion years ago. It's a very different kind of telescope. The Hubble telescope is optimized to see the part of the universe that our eyes can see, whereas the James Webb telescope is optimized to see in the infrared part of the spectrum, which gives us a whole different set of information about the universe. The telescope's infrared eyes will also stare down black holes and hunt for alien worlds, scouring the planet's atmospheres for water and other possible hints of life. That ability comes with enormous size requirements. Webb's mirror is the size of several parking spots, with its sunshade as big as a tennis court. It's so large it had to be folded origami style to fit into the nose cone of the European Ariane rocket, which will carry it up. But its folded nature means it all must unfold once in orbit. The failure of any of its 344 parts could doom the mission. Plus, Webb is set to orbit around the sun roughly 100 million miles from Earth, too far for a rescue mission. Webb's mission to understand exoplanets, I think, goes really to some of the core of our humanity, these fundamental questions of, are we alone in the universe? Where do we come from? Where do we go? The universe is so huge. You know, you'd think that out there somewhere there will be life, but we don't know. We have to build large instruments to tell. And Webb will make a big leap in that direction. The telescope and its rocket are poised for liftoff from Europe's spaceport in French Guiana, along Africa's coast. The Christmas Day launch is set for around 7.30 a.m. That's after several weather postponements. If all goes according to plan, Webb will be released from the rocket after a 26-minute ride into space, and it will then coast to its destination over the course of a month. Then in another five months, its infrared instruments will get to work. The telescope is an international collaboration led by NASA in partnership with the European and Canadian space agencies. We have plans for the first year. There are things that we think we'll see. We think we'll see the first galaxies. Um, we, we will characterize atmospheres of exoplanets, but we will find new things that we have no idea exists right now. And I'm so excited to find out what that is. NTD News, New York. 
Up next, you've probably heard of New York City's Christmas attractions. Many are in Manhattan, like the Rockefeller Center tree, but the city has more to offer. We bring you to a spectacular winter wonderland tucked away in a small Brooklyn neighborhood. Denzel Washington returns to the director's chair for the drama, A Journal for Jordan, a story about love and life lessons based on the memoir by Pulitzer Prize winner Dana Kennedy. Stay tuned to find out more. You can see Christmas decorations in all of New York City, but there's one neighborhood that outdoes the rest and transforms into a winter wonderland. Entity's Arian Pastar tells us more. We're at the Diker Heights Christmas Heights in southern Brooklyn, and if you're visiting New York City this weekend, you might want to stop by. I know it's not in Manhattan, but a lot of people think it's worth the trip. Lights on almost every single house. A couple from Minnesota told me they like this little neighborhood even more than Manhattan. I think it's even better because it's in a neighborhood. It shows um, holiday spirit kind of at the more local level and not as commercialized. People from all over the world come to see this small, out-of-the-way New York City neighborhood to see the lights. Some even take guided tours. Foreigners told me this neighborhood gives them a Christmas feeling they didn't have before. You can feel the magic here, like more than in France. In Brazil, it's summer right now, and this is the Christmas that we saw on the movies and we see everywhere. The people we saw enjoyed all the decorated houses, but do they have a favorite? There's a house, I, don't, I can't remember what block it's on, but it's all green. It is all green, I freaking love it. It's like the Grinch's house. <laughs> the greenhouse definitely stands out with its music and over 50,000 green light bulbs. In case you're wondering about the cost for all these lights, according to one report, some of the houses here spent between five to eight thousand dollars in December just for their electricity bills. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. Moscow residents get to enjoy a spectacular display of Christmas trees themed on cities from around the world. There are trees that represent New York, Vienna, Paris, and Lipson. They are part of Moscow's traditional Journey to Christmas festival. Let's take a look. This Christmas tree with pasta-shaped decorations represents an Italian resort town. This tree with golden Oscar statuettes represents Hollywood. And this tree with umbrellas and trams represents Lisbon. They are all part of the Gallery of Designer Christmas Trees project in Moscow. 15 famous people from Moscow made incredibly beautiful Christmas trees dedicated to the most famous and largest cities in the world. Since our citizens cannot travel today, they have a unique opportunity to come and see the Christmas trees that adorn different cities in different capitals. Russian designers, musicians, actors and ballet dancers created the trees. The project is part of the wider journey to Christmas festival. 27 sites have been set up across the city for it. Each of them represents holiday traditions of different countries. Organizers say they hope to bring a touch of seasonal cheer. I can say with full confidence that our Christmas trees are the most beautiful in the city. I wish for everyone who isn't in a New Year's mood or who needs to get a boost of emotions to come here and see these trees with their own eyes. The Christmas festival also features 20 Christmas markets, 21 merry-go-rounds, sports activities, open-air curling competitions, and 18 free skating rinks. I like the way Moscow is decorated. I like the mood of the upcoming holiday. We live in Moscow, but rarely manage to get out somewhere to visit places. So we decided that we would take advantage of this. The Christmas festival has been an annual event since 2013. It will run until January 9th. An exhibition in London dives into the vast Port of London Authority collection to reveal the humbling scale of the international port fully for the first time. London Port City charts its life since the final days of the 18th century. We've got more from NTD's Neil Woodrow. The Port of London was once the largest in the world. The Museum of London Docklands exhibition highlights its importance for the people, culture and the country's position in the world for over 200 years to the present day. 
This new exhibition in partnership with the Port of London Authority, or PLA, reveals the ongoing influence of the port on the capital city and explores complex operations that have enabled the port to connect London to the rest of the world. Alistair Gale from the PLA tells us the city of London and the port are intrinsically linked. The city really grew from the port. It was basically the, the place where you could ford the river, cross the river and bring stuff ashore. And from that slowly grew the, the world's biggest port with enclosed docks um, that everybody would recognise. And in fact, the enclosed docks are one of the few things you can actually see uh, in satellite images from space. Um, they're so large. But over time, the ships grew larger and they needed deeper water, so they went further downriver. The next area of the exhibition expands on the Thames area's diversity. So this is one of my favourite parts of the exhibition. This is where it's a properly immersive experience because you can sit uh, in this little uh, theatre and effectively immerse yourself in all of the different uses of the Thames today. Gail says people are really engaging with the area. The tidal Thames, which runs from Teddington Lock all the way out to the North Sea, and over those 95 miles, you effectively have um, a, a river which is a bit of a playground, which goes from Teddington Lock to Putney, where people are doing rowing, uh, sailing. Stand-up paddleboarding has grown uh, really uh, hugely in its popularity in the last little while. And then through central London, with the only world city that has four UN World Heritage Sites on the banks of, of its river. Stories help to bring the experience to life. Gale says when he first came into the exhibition, this image struck him as emblematic of how important seafarers have been. He says many thousands of seafarers have worked far, far longer shifts on the ships in the past months to ensure that all of us receive the food, fuel and medicines needed through the pandemic. So it was really striking coming into the exhibition to find uh, an image of seafarers being cared for going back into the 1800s. So it's very much a tradition in London that the seafarers' contribution is valued and that we look after them um, when they come to London doing their essential job. In the image they are waiting for medical assessment. The port and its activities have influenced the language we use and also place names. The DLR station called Mud Chute is named after dredged mud taken from Millwall Dock and dumped via a mud chute. The name Posh, as a description for people, is actually believed to be linked to um, the noting that went on people's tickets, which was put for port out, starboard home, and basically ensured that those passengers had the nicest cabins because they wouldn't be so hot in the middle of the day. Gail says the exhibition gives people a chance to experience the sights, sound and even the smells of the Port of London. And this last uh, area that we're at, uh, which has some boxes, literally you can lift the lid and you can uh, smell the aroma of the historic port. Some of them are nicer, uh, some of them are not so nice, so if you get the uh, spices then you'll be okay. If you're looking at smelling the hides and the fish it's not quite as pleasant, but it's all part of life. The exhibition runs until the 8th of May. It's fascinating to understand London as a port city and the vital role it plays. Neil Woodrow, NTD News, London. Oscar-winning actor Denzel Washington returns to the director's chair for the drama A Journal for Jordan, a story about love and life lessons based on the memoir by Pulitzer Prize winner Dana Kennedy. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. What's this? It's a journal. After it's Kennedy's fiancé, U.S. Army First Sergeant Charles King, was killed during the Iraq War, she turned a journal he left for their son Jordan into an essay and later a book. The film depicts the teachings he wrote to Jordan and the couple's love story. Actor Michael B. Jordan plays Charles in the film and joked that some of the romantic scenes will make men realize they need to do more for women. And after some convincing, she fell for me too. This movie's gonna make it hard on a lot, lot of guys out there, so <laughs> I think Charles was a stand-up guy, you know, and, I, and he was flawed as well, but he strove to be the best, you know, and I think, you know, the ups and downs of their relationship there's a lot of key moments in there uh, between their relationship that uh, I think we're going to get that, that reaction from. Newcomer Shante Adams plays Kennedy and said men are reacting well to the movie. Men are reacting really well to the movie, especially fathers that feel like, okay, 
it's time for us to write a journal. Like, what does it mean to leave something for your child, uh, to, to leave advice and to leave wisdom? And, you know, boys are seeing this film and, and realizing there, there's this beautiful scene where Charles writes to Jordan that it's okay to cry. I think you are beautiful. King began writing the journal in 2005. Former journalist Kennedy published her memoir in 2008. Kennedy is now senior vice president and publisher at Simon & Schuster. She said Charles would be humbled and honored over the film, but coy about how much skin Jordan shows. Well, he would be humbled, he would be bashful about it, and he'd be, he would be incredibly proud. Uh, he, was, he was very shy, and so, so the idea of somebody playing with him without their shirt on in a movie, he'd say, you did what, you crazy woman? And so I think he would be, but he'd be moved and, and, and honored. A journal for Jordan will be released in U.S. theaters on December 25th. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. I pray I don't run out of time. Thanks for watching. At NTD, we're honored to be your source for the news. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. In New York City, I'm Kevin Hogan.